I know that we're still engaged in conversation. Don't worry, I've built a nice lunch break so we can continue to have that conversation, but I don't want to shortchange the incredible panel that we have coming up right now. Um, this is what I think of as a, as a, not all of the panels have been amazing. I think of this panel as a particularly critical panel in anchoring this symposium, um, tying this symposium to the collection of Munia Abu Jamal and to what is um, referenced in that collection to the incredible material. Um, I'm seeing the processing archivist nod at me, which makes me feel good. <laughs> our, our, the time I've spent with the collection mirrors, mirrors that. So without further ado, I'm um, pleased, very pleased and honored to introduce this panel, The Crisis of Medical Care and the Carceral State. This panel is moderated by an incredible gem of a human, a really talented and generous person, Christine Montrose, who is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, Associate Professor of Medical Science at Brown University, also a poet. We have a lot of poetry in this symposium. Our distinguished panels are Josiah Rich, Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at Brown University, attending physician at Rhode Island Hospital and the Miriam Hospital, Hope Metcalf, who is a lecturer at Yale Law School, among many other things that Hope will tell us about. She was very modest in how she wanted to be listed in the program. And Lauren Weinstock, Professor of Psychiatry and Human Behavior here at Brown University. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks very much. Um, I, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, thank you all for being in attendance. I'm still a little breathless after the last panel and the engaging discussion that was there. So. We feel some pressure to be equally interesting. Um, but I, I would like to certainly first start by thanking Amanda for bringing us here today. And also, um, to the degree that you're aware, Amanda's absolute um, determination to acquire this collection for our esteemed university um, to go up against some of the resistance that was felt in that acquisition and really persevere um, showed a degree of clear-sightedness that uh, will benefit us all, I think. So um, I wanted to give her a little bit of acknowledgement for that work that has brought us here today, but also has brought that incredibly important collection here to Brown. Um, and also wanted to thank Christopher West, who um, has, has been an instrumental part of that as well, um, really thoughtfully um, considering how to integrate um, this collection into our community and into our nation more broadly. Um, and he has been incredibly helpful to me as well in preparation, preparation for today. So um, thanks to them. Thank you for these panelists for coming. Um, we wanted to ground this partially in Rhode Island, um, but I couldn't resist having Hope come as well since she's from a neighboring state. But we, you know, I was, I was listening to those comments about community today, really, those were really resonating with me. And so I was grateful that we had community members here to talk about some of what's going on here in Rhode Island. Um, so, so we have this gift to bring together today people who um, come from different realms with different viewpoints on the questions of medical needs of people who are incarcerated, the people who we as a society detain. I think pe the people on the stage today have also seen firsthand the failures that uh, the system has done over and over again in meeting those needs. Um, and, and I think are all working in different ways to address these disparities and these failures. So I'm, I'm excited today to have an opportunity to have them share with you um, the things that they've observed, the work that they're doing, the direction in which we still have to go, the work that is still ahead of us. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, as, as Amanda said. I, I practice at Butler Hospital with severely mentally ill people in the inpatient units there. Um, and my, my introduction to our, our carceral system and my work within it really came um, from listening to my patients that I see at the hospital, to listening to them um, talk about their interactions with uh, the, the criminal legal system. And I think following on this morning's panel that many of us, were in, for many of us attended, um, it's a really natural progression to talk about policing um, and then to talk about healthcare. Because what I have learned over and over is that my patients 
often are coming in contact with police and oftentimes the carceral system because of the same symptoms that might just as easily wind them up in my hospital. Um, people with mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed by police than people who do not have mental illnesses. And so this is a really critical juncture. And as you'll hear from some of our panelists, um, those medical and mental health needs um, are, are a liability for those, the people who struggle with them in our community, and particularly as has been raised with um, people in black and brown communities in particular. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to be able to launch this discussion today to hear from our panelists about the work that they're doing. Um, I've been asked appropriately, I think, not to go into lengthy biographies of our panelists. Those are all listed for you today. So my goal is to have each person share a, a line or two about um, about their work and and what the, and the kinds of things that the experiences that they've had and the kinds of things that they'd like to share with you about those experiences. Um, you'll hear me. I know um, Dr. Rich was introduced as Josiah. You'll hear me refer to him as Jody, and that's how I think most people refer to him. Um, so I didn't want to be confusing, and I'll call people by their first names, though um, people have certainly earned the, the titles that they walk in here with today. But Jody, I'm hoping that you will begin by talking about your experiences at Miriam Hospital here in Rhode Island um, and, and the kind of um, contrast that you've seen between the care in a facility that is therapeutic by nature, a hospital, and a facility that is necessarily punitive by nature, and what happens when people with those, the same medical needs are seen in facilities with very different intent. Well, <clears throat> I'm... Uh... Delighted to be sitting here on this green couch because we were just remarking, you know, coming into this gray building and looking at these gray chairs and these gray walls, uh, it reminds me of the Department of Corrections and uh, a place that I've spent time every week for the last uh, three decades. Uh, but I remind my students I've also been released every week for the last three decades. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, I, it was kind of a joke that I've been released from incarceration. Uh, I've been locked up every, every week uh, doing clinical care at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections for the last three decades, but I've also been released. Um, but the, these institutions, and I've visited institutions, uh, correctional institutions in four continents and all over the country, and it's, they are dehumanizing. And uh, what uh, I want to just emphasize that this, this is an aberrancy, this mass incarceration that we have now. Never in history have we ever had anything like this. No other country does anything like this. And we have a unique fascination with incarceration. <clears throat> a lot of that is based on our uh, racist war on drugs um, and our uh, failure to adequately treat uh, mental illness um, and, and, uh, and addiction. So, um, you know, uh, Brian Stevenson uh, he wrote this book, uh, Just Mercy, and talks, uh, if you ever get a chance to see him, he's, he's a very eloquent uh, speaker um, and, uh, and well worth it. Uh, but he talks about getting proximate, and he worked with people on death row and, and got to know them and know them as individuals. And, and that's kind of what I've been doing for the last uh, three decades, is getting proximate to people who've been incarcerated. Um, and uh, I guess what I'm gonna do is share a little, you know, some of my impressions and thoughts about that. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's just wrong. It's, it's, we're gonna look back on this in history and look back and say, what were they thinking? Like, what is, are you locking people up? We go right there. You know, we have TV shows about cops. We have TV, we're fascinated with it. Um, but um, <clears throat> uh, so um, I think part of that, it's our culture. Like we, you know, we want to change behavior. We want to stop people to stop doing certain things. We, we make a law about it, but we go right to incarceration. There's a lot of other things you can do before incarceration to get people to change behavior if that's really the goal. And really what's lacking is a, is a conversation with, within our culture, uh, within our society, is what are we trying to do with all this incarceration? 
uh, because I think we just don't know. We just do it because that's what we do. Um, but uh, it's wrong. It's not getting, it's certainly not helping the opi opioid overdose crisis. Um, it's sort of exacerbating it. Uh, it's certainly not helping our uh, racial uh, divides and our cultural divides and our, you know, finance, you know, fiscal divides. It's, it's just bad all the way around from what I see. Now that said, I understand there are some people that, you know, need a timeout and there's some people that, you know, need to be separated from other people to, for, you know, that's the best we can do for their health and, and uh, society's health, but not to this degree by any means. Um, I just leave one final thing is when I first started going in and I came here uh, in 94 to work, trained in infectious diseases to work on the HIV epidemic, which at the time we didn't have effective treatment. It was a, you know, fatal disease uh, and it was, it was horrible. Um, and when I came to Rhode Island, people were uh, diagnosed with HIV in the Department of Corrections. In fact, there was an aggressive uh, testing program and a third of the people in the state you know, that is a big slice, you know, if this is the pie, that's a pretty big slice of the pie to be ignoring. A third of them were diagnosed at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. They were pretty much testing everybody. Um, and so that, you know, on the one hand, this mass incarceration is like an ocean liner, and we've got to turn it all the way around, and we've got to work on that, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. But the second thing is there are opportunities to actually improve things. I used to kind of jokingly say, oh, how convenient of the state to take all these people with HIV or at risk for HIV or mental illness or other, you know, bring them and other medical problems and public health problems and bring them, bring them by, a, you know, one facility that's a nurse. You can have medical interventions. You can help them. You can transition them to the community. So it's, it's an abomination, but while it's there, uh, there are things we could do to take advantage of it to help help people. Um, so those are really the two things that I, I think about with corrections. Maybe I'll Thank, stop there. That, thanks, Jody. And I think um, I always appreciate your perspective. And I also think the the one thing that struck me when you said we you know we don't really know why, why we do this. And I think I'm hoping I hope we'll talk a little bit. I think we do we do know why we do this. I think that these systems are really designed to be oppressive systems. And I think um, as people involved in mental health, we also really see, and I, I'm hoping that Hope will speak a little bit about too, the ways in which um, these facilities are specifically designed, they're not just passively enacting psychological harm or medical harm um, on the people that are held within them, they're really actively designed um, to enact that harm. And so um, with that, I think I'll shift, shift to Hope and, and say, I'm looking forward to having you share a perspective on, on that piece, um, on your work in facilities and, and the, the harm that they are designed to enact. Sure, um, so thank you so much for having me. I, um, I should say that uh, I'm a lawyer, please don't hold that against me. Um, and uh, so I came to this, um, this area of work and specifically to, to come to really learn from and love my clients and their communities out of, um, as a baby lawyer, I graduated law school in 2001. And so I spent the first decade of my career suing the US government um, to try to force it to stop torturing people in its so-called war on terror. So I'm gonna show a couple of slides and I wanted, I do wanna give just a trigger warning here because I'm, I then went from Guantanamo to work uh, for about 10 years in Connecticut Supermax prison until all of us who worked together and we finally got it shut down. So there's a happy ending to this story, but I am gonna show some photos um, uh, which Christine thought would be appropriate um, just to kind of illustrate some of the points I'm gonna make. Um, but apologies in advance because they are grotesque. Okay, so, all right, so this is just to make the point that um, that Guantanamo Bay was talked about in our culture and at the political moment, for those of you who were alive and recall how things were back then, um, kind of on all sides. So the Bush administration described it as a place for the worst of the worst. It was um, meant to be unique, um, outside of the legal justice system. And people on my side 
we would make arguments before the courts and other places to say, oh, it's an it's abomination, it's un-American, et cetera. Well, of course it's not an American, and, and this slide is just meant to illustrate, to show that there on the left is Guantanamo Bay. You can see the design and actually how similar it looks to the federal supermax prison, which is known as Florence ADX. And I became, um, interested not, is not that, I, I, I became woken to um, this sort of everyday torture that happens throughout this country when I had a client who we had been fighting on behalf of, whose name was Jose Padilla. He was the only US citizen seized, detained, and tortured by the US military. Um, and he was transferred. Finally, we won because we got him out of the military system into the civilian system. And he went from, not from Guantanamo, because he was held at a brig in, um, naval brig in South Carolina, but he went to the Florence ADX. And he was subjected to the regular treatment there, which was functionally the same as what we had been screaming about that was happening at Guantanamo. And so that was really radicalizing for me. Um, and so then I, because I believe in proximity, I love that quote, thank you, and I live and work in New Haven, Connecticut, and it really mattered to me that I, and I teach students, so I teach a human rights clinic, and it really mattered to me that we be doing work in our own backyard, and there's a phrase of bringing human rights home, and that human rights is not something that needs to be fought solely outside of the US, um, but actually very much needs to be fought for at home. So I uh, called up uh, my friend who's at the ACLU of Connecticut, and I said, you know, I'd like to do something closer to home. I don't really know that much. I, I don't have that many skills. Mostly I just know about torture. And he said, well, actually, we've been getting dozens and dozens of letters from people at this place called Northern, which was Connecticut's like cheapo version of the federal supermax. And so this is Northern. And it was designed, when I say cheapo, it's because Florence, um, they spent, I don't even know how many millions of dollars to put it underground. So the cells you never see outside, you can only see up. So you literally, when you go in, you go underground. Um, and then at Northern, because Connecticut couldn't quite afford that, but it was built during President Clinton's prison boom um, in 1996, they made it so that you go in through an elevator on the first floor and then you take a, a <laughs> You go up to the second floor and then you walk down this long hallway with no windows as though you're going underground. So that's, that's what they did. And um, there was a documentary that, some, um, that, that we kind of collaborated with that was made at this point quite a while ago. Um, but they interviewed the architect and, um, and he was really proud of this design. Okay, this is what the inside of a typical cell is. This was footage from that documentary that was taken by DOC staff. Um, and this just gives you a sense. And when we um, went in to talk with folks, we were meeting with people who had been there since the prison opened. So they had been there for you know 15 years straight. Um, one of our clients, he's a, just a genius litigator, I learned so much from him, um, uh, that, uh, he trained himself to litigate from a cell like this where he went at age 17 and he didn't leave until he was 34. Um, so when we say about, you know, so, so I guess my reflection is on this, you know, there is, there is certainly casual negligent harm that can be created in the system, but there is no question in my mind that um, there are parts of the system that is intentionally breaking people or trying to break people. And in fact, this question about what are we doing and why, that was my first question when we finally, we, so we, we spent time documenting, interviewing people, trying to understand what was the internal logic of this crazy hall of mirrors. And we sat down with DOC leadership, with the actual commissioner, I said, what, what are you trying to accomplish? Just a very simple question, what are you trying to accomplish? And he couldn't answer, he just couldn't answer. Because once you get a place like this going, it takes on a logic of his own. But then I asked his captain, who um, I, I had the opportunity to sit down with, and this is a guy who was notoriously a hard ass. And I said, well, so tell me, so you put here people here because they're not safe, but then when do you know they're ready to leave? And he said, well, when they're broken. And that 
is why it exists, right? And obviously there's racism that is threaded throughout and undergirds this whole thing. Um, so this is where you take quote unquote recreation. And this is just, I, again, I'm sorry for the graphic nature of these photos. This on the left, again, we're back to Guantanamo. This is how people were brought in. These, these photos were broadcast all over the news media by the Bush administration as an attempt, I suppose, to show that we, quote unquote, were safe because they were um, completely dehumanized, hooded, set away. On the right is a still from what's known as a cell extraction in the main system. I don't have a similar photo, but I have interviewed dozens, if not hundreds, of people who have experienced something similar in DOC, which is typically happens when someone is locked up in a solitary cell, or it doesn't have to be solitary, you could be double-celled. But you're on lockdown in that abysmal place, and something that happens to the human brain is you start to lose your sense of reality, you start to seek out sensation, and you can engage in all kinds of self-harm, acting out that might look like banging your head, uh, kicking the door, et cetera. And the response from the system, and this still happens in Connecticut, we have a lawsuit about it, is that there's a SWAT team and you are treated as public enemy number one instead of someone who is actively trying to harm yourself. Again, this is a single person in a locked cell. That's how they respond. Okay, so I wanted to reflect just a little bit quickly on sort of why is it so hard to mobilize change? Because I told you that there is, I don't wanna say it's a happy story, but we did make progress. This is why it's so difficult. Um, I won't go through all of them, but there's many, many things that conspire to, to make social change difficult to bring to prison. Um, the, the point of the slide is to show that there is an over-reliance on law and lawyers. And Mumia Abba-Jamal ha himself has spoken about this. He has a great book on jailhouse lawyering that I use to teach my students about sort of the, the myth of law in the US system in terms of creating change. And, um, and the, but prisons are places where politics is not supposed to exist. Organizing is banned, specifically. Um, things like hunger strikes are met with um, overt force. Um, so there is no place for political organizing, um, except really through very courageous people on the inside who can find people on the outside to collaborate with. And that's kind of where I and my students came in. Um, so I'm happy in the Q&A to, to answer questions about kind of the techniques we used to try to create change. But I just wanted to, the, here's, here's the, the quote by Mumia um, that talks about sort of the, the myth of the law and what it can bring and why we really need to think outside the law and beyond the law for the world that we want to create. And then, but the, the paradox is that in prison, which I think of as going into North Korea, it's precisely in those spaces that are the least democratic spaces that we most need what we call political lawyering, which is people who, I, I have access and I can speak confidentially in places where not most of you cannot. And I can go places where most of you cannot just because I have, I am officially part of this legal system that is itself so oppressive. So that's really paradoxical. So what did we do? We used that access to work with people and to um, really support a movement from the inside and the outside. And I guess the slide I wanna close with, um, we managed to pass something called the Protect. So we managed to get the prison shut down. The governor was facing so much pressure that he closed the prison. Um, and I can explain more how we did that if, if people are interested. And then um, there was a group called Stop Solitary Connecticut, um, led by a longtime organizer, Ms. Barbara Fair, and we worked in partnership with them as well as our partners on the inside to pass something called the Protect Act, which effectively bans long-term solitary confinement, um, it, and it does so by ensuring a minimum time out of cell of five hours out of cell. Um, which sounds like very little, unless you realize that actually for the general population in maximum prison, maximum facilities, maximum security facilities, they were only getting less than um, 
four or three hours out of cell. So functionally, Connecticut was on lockdown all the time. It's just a first step. The last thing I want to say is that we recognized, to go back to Lumia's quote, is that reforms, just got, they just scratch the surface. We need a transformation, period. So we are under no illusion that this time out of cell is, is a magic fix. We chose to focus on that because we caucused and we did questionnaires with people and we asked, what matters to you? Well, how can we make your life now a little better? And that was a big thing that we got back. The second thing that people said that they really cared about was having a voice in the system to change the politics because none of this is going to either, even, even if you get the reform right, which chances are you won't unless you have people in the room with lived experience, it's not gonna be durable at all as a solution because someone was talking in the last panel about all you need is one cop to get hurt and suddenly it will undo all the work the communities put in. Same thing in the prison. Um, and so we see already tons of, of opposition by the corrections unions. So what, what um, the strategy that we used was to create independent oversight that has never existed in Connecticut's prisons and also to place that independent ombuds not only outside of the correction system, um, but under the surveillance or supervision of what's called a correction advisory committee that expressly under the statute must include representation from people with lived experience. Um, and so that's our attempt at like a first baby step to changing the politics and to shift the conversation. And I can say, it's not perfect. Again, there's the, these are really fraught battles that we're fighting right now as I speak. But I do see over the last five, 10 years that the dynamic and the politics are shifting. And I see especially that people with lived experience, whether they're family members of formerly incarcerated people, people who themselves have experienced incarceration, even um, people I know on the inside, they feel much more empowered and emboldened to participate in that conversation, and that's really what's giving me hope. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, every time I hear Hope speak, I get inspired and have 14 thoughts going in 14 different directions. Um, and and so I'll share a couple of those before moving on to Dr. Weinstock, which I'm also really excited to do. One is to say that there is a reconstruction of a cell at the Hay Library as part of the exhibit. For those of you that have not yet been to the exhibit, please go. Um, and I think to feel in a physical, three-dimensional way um, some of the things that you're seeing in a two-dimensional way here, um, that's one very meaningful thing that Amanda and Christopher and others have done there to help us try to begin to understand. Um, you know, I, I, I love that you say hope um, that that we're privileged to be able to go into these places. I think as, as physicians, as psychologists, as lawyers, we have access to go into some of these places and, and therefore our responsibility then to share what we see within them because of the intentionality around preventing information from getting out. So I think that um, the exhibit in part is, is, is trying to break that, um, that um, I'm thinking about the architect again, but uh, trying to break that wall that's so forcibly created. Um, <clears throat> in Rhode Island, I often think that Rhode Island should be the perfect microcosm to be a laboratory for making some of these changes. Um, Rhode Island also is a small state with a very long institutional memory. So in our own state, some of what we've bumped up against in the trouble with um, trying to abolish solitary confinement is exactly what you say, which is, um, a member of the correctional staff at the ACI will say, yeah, but 20 years ago, my uncle was attacked by someone who wasn't in solitary, and so that one act from two decades ago therefore justifies within the union the continuation of this torture practice. So that's something that we're familiar with here in Rhode Island. Um, I just wanted to say, too, I, I did a, a fair amount of work in Northern and, and um, it was awful to, <laughs> to be reminded of it. I, I perform competency to stand trial evaluations in the jails and prisons, so these are when the judge or lawyers have concerns about a defendant's ability to participate in the court process and have a, an understanding to be able to understand their charges and how court works and work with their attorney. The judge can order these evaluations for a mental health clinician to evaluate them to make sure that it's fair for them to um, proceed that they have an adequate understanding. And in Northern, um, when I would go, 
Um, one of the things, no matter what facility I'm in, is that, uh, that I'm struck by is that the people that I see are, are really identical to the people that I see in the hospital. Um, there's no difference, of course, but, but I think people have this sense that there would be a difference, but the mentally ill people I see are only different based on the facility. When I see people in the hospital, I walk into their rooms and sit down next to them and have conversations with them. When I would see them in Northern, um, they'd be shackled at the feet, shackled um, at the wrist, chained to a metal loop that was sunk into a concrete floor. So when we think about tangible methods of dehumanization, um, these facilities are doing exactly that. And the architect um, of Northern said, said that and also said when you walk into that tunnel, you see visually there's a long way to go. It's a long, dark path, and we wanted that. We, that was their intention. Also in Northern, this idea, uh, there was an architectural idea with which I was unfamiliar called borrowed light. They didn't want any direct light. They didn't want people held within the facility to have access to any natural light. So they intentionally constructed the facility in certain places so that light would come in from other sources but would intentionally deprive people of natural light. We in mental health know how critical natural light is to basic well-being, so um, that was really chilling for me to learn about. So um, speaking then about the psychological ramifications of people who face incarceration and some of the emergencies that arise then um, in those early moments and in the ongoing moments, I'm really delighted that um, Dr. Lauren Weinstock has agreed to come and talk with us about her research um, and her work in mental health and prison populations. So I'll turn it over to you, Lauren. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Can everyone hear me okay? So first of all, I want to say I'm very humbled to be here and to be included in the dialogue. I, you know, I recognize that what we're talking about is so layered and multifaceted. And I bring um, my perspective as a psychologist working with people who are under correctional control. Um, but I really just value so deeply everyone's different perspectives with lived experience coming from humanities, arts, social science, et cetera. So I, I just really need to say that up front that I recognize that my perspective is just one tiny little perspective in a much larger conversation. So thank you for having me. Um, I am a clinical psychologist. I'm a professor here in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at Brown. And um, like Christine, I came to this work from a place, I came to Brown 20 years ago, and my interest was in um, working with acutely ill people with serious mental illness and people who are at high risk for suicide. And the work was largely based out of Butler Hospital. Um, I also do work with the Veterans Affairs Administration, so we work out of the VA as well. And the focus was really around how do we best support people um, who are in acute situations, um, acute psychiatric crisis, as they're leaving the hospital and returning to their communities. Um, and that also includes people who are being discharged from emergency departments back to their communities. And so our research has really focused on develop, developing and evaluating programs that are really meant to be a supporting hand or a scaffold to help people make those transitions in care um, where they're very likely to fall through the cracks. And that's, that's a phrase that I think about a lot in my work is where do people fall through the cracks in the system? And so, not surprisingly to anyone in this room, you might imagine that about 10 years into this work, um, my, my focus really started to shift towards working with people who are probably at greatest risk of falling through the cracks in our systems, and those are people who are um, involved in the criminal legal system. Um, and so we've taken our research to um, develop and evaluate programs that are, I, you know, de designed to really help and scaffold and support people during these really challenging times. We're going from basically, you know, we talk about healthcare transitions, people within the healthcare system, they're going from basically the carceral system and ideally to the healthcare system, but often never even make it there. And so um, that is kind of where my work lands. And I'll share, and I think it's actually really consistent with some of the, the conversations we've had to do so far, that when I've shared that with people, when people have asked me, what do you do? A friend once said to me very pointedly, she said, well, Lauren, that's hardly an abolitionist perspective. And she was right. And I 
think about that all the time too, because what I think, you know, when we talk about mass incarceration of people, we cannot ignore the fact that there's also a mass incarceration of people with serious mental illness and people who are at serious risk for suicide. And, and I think the, we need to look to the systems and the policies and all of the, the various complex problems in our society that have led us to this place. But we're also really focused on how do we help people now? People are stuck in this system, what do we do? How do we help them? And so um, I share that simply because that's an inner tension that I feel in my own work. I know, hope you just reflected on that yourself. You got people out of their their solitary confinement for a couple hours a day that doesn't feel like enough. Like we need to do so much more. And, and I think a lot about my role as a scientist and a psychologist and a professor. And I really, at this point in this work, feel like I need to become an advocate <laughs> and a fighter too. And I don't know exactly how to do that, but I'm trying. So I'll just, um, just say a few more words. I'll say too that when I talk about this work, when we talk about people with serious mental illness and people who are at risk for suicide, when I talk to people about this, they're very interested in what's happening on the inside. They wanna talk about what is happening in jails and prisons that contribute to the maintenance and worsening of psychiatric symptoms or people's risk for suicide. And that there's a lot to say about that. But what I also like to point out and want to kind of turn people's focus towards is also the question of something that's more downstream, which is what is happening that is contributing to the trends and patterns where they're finding themselves in there in the first place, right? And then not only that, but, and it came up in the policing um, panel just before now, someone used the word financial spiral. I would say that I also have observed what I would call an illness spiral. So not only what's happening, excuse me, before incarceration and what's happening during incarceration, but what's happening afterwards. And people find themselves in a situation, in my experience, quite frequently in which they are not receiving care, they decompensate, they experience psychiatric crisis, and then find themselves back in contact with law enforcement. And even when people are seeking care and help, it often backfires. So I'll share a story. We did a study of something called safety planning for suicide prevention for people who were in jail here in Rhode Island at the ACI and in men's intake, or women's, women's too, and also at the Genesee County Jail in Flint, Michigan. And part of safety planning is helping people build a plan to keep themselves safe when they feel suicidal. And that includes, at a certain step in the plan, um, when do you know that you need help? When do you need to go to the emergency department or call your doctor or go somewhere where you can get health care? And we were working with someone in our study who had got, it was a randomized trial, so not everyone got the safety plan, but this was a woman who got the safety plan, found herself in a suicidal crisis and said, I'm gonna follow my safety plan. And she took herself to the emergency department that morning, was evaluated, actually, um, felt better over the course of the emergency department visit and was discharged from the emergency department. So she was not admitted to the inpatient unit. But what had happened is that she was on a work release. And because she had taken herself to the emergency department in a suicidal crisis seeking care and help, she was then later rearrested for not showing up to her work release duties for the day. And I have many, many stories like that. So when we talk about spirals and where people get stuck in the system, I think an illness spiral is one that's very concerning and one that we really need to be focusing on. So maybe I'll stop there. Yeah, great, thank you. I think you know one, one of the things that, that will come up over and over through, through the symposium, but certainly I think we are um, interacting with it every day, are these questions of, of systems failures um, and I think that example is, is clearly one. One I can think of is um, speaking with a former police commander in Portland, Oregon, who shared a story about how the healthcare system is really a, a part of this failure as well. She described a situation where there was a man at the Portland waterfront who had a gallon jug of fluid attached to a chain and was swinging it above his head. He was clearly mentally ill. Um, and it was frightening people. And so people were seeing this and, and eventually called the police. The police came, 
um, without using any force, got the gentleman to agree to get into the car, took him to the emergency room, and the police commander said to me, she said, um, he was discharged from the emergency room before we were done with our paperwork. So there were no psychiatric beds available. He was deemed to not be a risk to himself or to others despite this erratic behavior. So he returned to the waterfront, resumed that activity. People called police again, and of course, this time they took him to jail. Um, and, and so that, those moments that show, and, and uh, um, Louis Serbo, who's the, the psychologist here at the, the, at the ACI, said, you know, we have an ironclad no refusal policy. You hospitals can say, we don't have room for you. But if someone is brought to jail, we admit them to jail. And, and, and so this is really where systemic failures um, are highlighted for those of us on the clinical side. Um, there are our correctional officers or police officers who have said to me, at least, you know, we, we come across this, this homeless, mentally ill person who's not on his medication, and at least I know if he's in the ACI that he will have three hots in a cot and maybe someone will give him his medication. Well, we would never do this to someone with diabetes. We would never arrest them to make sure that they got their insulin. We would never arrest someone to make sure that they had access to their chemotherapy. So I think that, that we see in these systemic moments um, the failures for people with mental illness, and of course those are the ones of which I'm most aware, and, and I'll ask Jody about this also. I'm most aware of those because of my work in psychiatry. Someone's have a, having a psychiatric emergency, they call 911. Um, well, if you're having a heart attack and you call 911, the people who show up to see you are EMTs who can administer medication, who can start an IV if they need to, who can transport you efficiently to a hospital. If you're in a car accident, they stabilize fractures and stop bleeding. If you're having a psychiatric emergency and you call 911, the people who show up are cops who have guns. So, so these are, are real, dis, very clear disparities and discrepancies in how we're treating different kinds of illnesses with radically different outcomes. So I was reminded, um, Jody, when you were talking about um, the irony that having people in a, a correctional facility is an opportunity for treatment because we, we fail to provide that treatment so regularly to people who are not incarcerated. Um, I was thinking about Sheriff Tom Dart in Chicago at the Cook County Jail, um, which you all may know is our, the largest psychiatric institution in the country. It's obviously not a psychiatric institution, but the concentration of mentally ill people there is so great that it is our nation's largest psychiatric institution. And he has he really worked over the years to implement a great deal of mental health programming there, which was expensive and time consuming, minimally effective, um, endlessly frustrating, and he would say, this is the wrong place to be providing these services, and if I really had my wish, I would let it all go and let, the, let everything crumble, but these are, are people's lives. So we are incarcerating these people, we do need to provide them with care while they are here. So this tension that I'm hearing from the panelists, which is, <clears throat> We are acknowledging that these places are unhealthy, detrimental places, and yet we are also acknowledging that the people within them need care and how, how to operate within that tension. So Jody, I guess I will return to you and say, um, when you think about the unique needs that people have at the ACI when you see them, um, can you speak a little bit about the primary kind of health concerns there and how you feel as though you are or are not able to provide the care that people need within that type of environment? Sure. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple things first that um, got a call last week from a reporter in Mississippi, and she was uh, she had found a number of cases where um, people had been uh, mentally ill on the street, and uh, 911 was called and the police showed up. And apparently in Mississippi they have a holdover law that allows them to take people and incarcerate them as opposed to a mental health. <clears throat> oh, thanks. Um, in Mississippi, they have a law that's held over from, I guess they got rid of it in Alabama, or I, it, it, it was more common than it, that allows police to take someone who they think is having a mental health crisis 
and bring them to a, uh, a jail instead of a, a healthcare facility, um, which sounds like a, not a good law to me. Uh, apparently, I got, got rid of it in other states. And she described this case where um, uh, a young woman had taken a whole bunch of Tylenol uh, in a suicide attempt, and uh, I think her mother called 911 and, and said that on the 911. The police get there and take her to the jail. They didn't mention anything about taking Tylenol. The care that she got there was minimal, and, and then within uh, a couple of days, she got clinically a lot worse and then died. Uh, and she had found a whole bunch of these other cases, uh, dozens or so, and was writing an article about it. And, and I just said, well, that's just, you know, that's obviously terrible care. It's not an institution designed to provide <coughs> medical care. But, um, you know, I, and when I reflected on it, I was like, you know, we do the same thing here, except we charge them with a crime. So in addition to not doing a good job with their mental health care, we now, now they're saddled with uh, being stuck in the system. And the system is like flypaper. You know, you, you step on it, and then you try and get your foot up, and you have to put your other foot down, and that's stuck, and then you can't get out. Um, you know, that, that uh, you know, you hear on the TV that the judge says, oh, well, you're just a first-time offender, so we're going to go easy on you. Well, the flip side of that is... If you've been, if you're back again, well, this time we're going to spank you. Um, uh, so, um, and and health, you know, it's not just Cook County. That's you know, the whole system has more mentally ill people than any anywhere else. And and it is the 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 warden is absolutely correct that they're not. This is not the right place to treat mental illness. You know, if you, I don't know much about psychiatry or treatment of mental illness, but I know when my patients get uh, in trouble, I refer them to psychiatrists and then they often get uh, hospitalized in a psychiatric facility and they go, they, they are thrown right into a routine. They go to group and then they go to breakfast and then they go to group and then they meet with their counselor, and then they go to group, and they meet with their psychologist, and then they go to group, and they meet with their doctor, and then they go to group, and they have activities, and then they, you know, it is socializing people, and that is part of the treatment. Like, people, as long as you're at group, it doesn't matter if everyone else is in crisis. If you're all together, you know, we need that. That's part of our DNA, that we're, we are social creatures. You know, this whole notion of, uh, you know, the American independent man, like, you know, you're independent, you're gonna die if you're a homo sapiens. We need each other. Um, and and uh, so, of course, what we do in corrections is the opposite. If you misbehave in the community, well, we take you and we put you in this cage. And then you misbehave there, we take you and put you in a smaller cage. And then we limit your time, and then you end up with, you know, one hour out a day. And, and of course, the results are quite clear. People get worse. They, they that is not what we need. We need this um, this uh, care. So I went into the Department of Corrections to deal with HIV and and you know developed helped to develop model programs to you know diagnose, treat, connect to care on the way out. And one thing that you know struck me initially was, you know, it, most of these people had either mental illness or addiction, or both. And if they got those issues addressed, when they got out, I would see them at the Miriam Hospital in our clinic. And we would you know, continue their care. And if they didn't get those things addressed, I would see them back at the intake again, rearrested, serving more time. And so this isn't the narrative that's been fed to me my whole life, and all of us, that oh, there are so-called bad people that are out there. These were not bad people. These were people with illness, with with situations with that that led to that. So if they, you know, if they were bad people, well, when they got onto methadone and they stopped shooting up heroin, then if they're so bad, why aren't they getting arrested again? Well, they're not. They're under control. So they got their mental health care, and they're onto the meds, and they got supportive, you know, community services. They're not. They don't need to be locked up, and most people don't that I've met. 
thousands of people over my career, and and vast majority of them don't need to be locked up, and don't need to be locked up for as long as they they are. Um, so then we get HIV sorted out, and we're kind of doing okay with that. And I started looking around, and it's like, wow, this population is not a normal population. Well, first of all, they're more black and brown people, but they're more poor people. They're less educated. Um, they don't have, uh, many of them are, are, don't have literacy, basic literacy. Many of them, uh, and then we talk about health literacy, which, uh, uh, which is a way of um, you know, navigating the healthcare system. And we did one study once where we looked and we asked people, well, do you have any problem with access to health care? This is before the Medicaid expansion. They said, oh, no, I don't have any problem with it. I can go to see a doctor anytime I want. So, oh, okay, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, if I get shot or stabbed or hit by a car, I can just go to the emergency room because that's their concept of health care. Well, do you ever get your blood pressure checked? Do you ever, anybody counsel you about diet? Do you get your vaccines? Do you, do you have a primary care doctor? And they're like, what is that? We don't do it, no. Their concept of health is when you have an acute illness. Um, and uh, so they didn't perceive that they were not, they didn't know what they weren't getting. Um, so, um, but in addition to this population being different on all those other levels, the health, the health problems they have are just, I mean, you can look at just about anything. Hypertension, diabetes, COPD, a lot of diseases that are, you know, people on the outside get, they're going to have more of it on the inside, and they're going to be um, they're going to be more severe and less uh, less access, less involved in healthcare. Um, so there is uh, this is a very ill population. They say on average, people who are incarcerated are, you know, ten years older, or sicker than their chronologic age. Um, there's, there's, uh, some people say there's a lot of miles on those chassis. Uh, they've had a rough life and they've had, uh, they've had a lot of stresses. Um, so, you know, healthcare, I, I, I love the idea that, that in Connecticut they have some kind of, you know, somebody's looking to see like what, you know, from the outside, what's going on in here. Um, because, uh, in, in Europe and in most of the civilized world, there is, uh, oversight uh, over correction facilities. In the U.S., we have practically none um, and, and very little. I mean, yeah, I can't tell you uh, the prevalence of diseases. I can't tell you, I can barely tell you how many people are dying behind bars. Okay. Uh, I, we don't have, I can't tell you how much the health care costs. I can't tell you about the, the uh, quality of the care. I can't tell you any of that because there's no oversight. In the hospital, there's a thing called the Joint Commission. And when the Joint Commission comes to the hospital, I lock myself in my office. And, and when I have to go out the office to walk through, I walk very quickly. Oh, sorry, uh, got to go see a sick patient. I can't talk now. I do not want to be the guy that brought the hospital down <laughs> to its knees because the Joint Commission will shut down the hospital if they find that you're not providing good care. Nothing like that exists in corrections. You gave lousy care, somebody died, oops. There's nothing, to, there's not really a feedback mechanism. There's litigation that has been, been uh, uh, chopped at the knees. Uh, um, so uh, we need that. We need oversight. We need independent outside oversight uh, of corrections and correctional health care. Um, Jody, I'm going to pipe you. in just because um, yeah. I'm getting signals about our timing from um, my helpful timekeeper. Um, so th thank you for that. And, and, you know, I was thinking about that, that theme of isolation versus connection that you touch on. And I'm hopeful, perhaps in the Q&A, um, Hope intended to speak, our time is running so short, intended to speak some about um, her, her work in Norway and elsewhere um, where the model is quite different. And I think about... Um, uh, one, uh, I think about points of entry to try to communicate to people um, in, in any way possible about um, the irrational logic behind our practices. Um, 
of incarceration. And one of the opportunities that I think the pandemic afforded was exactly this kind of thing. I have high school age children that were middle school age at the time that the pandemic began. And the number of parents that were whirling around suddenly with grave concern about the effects of isolation on their children, social isolation on their children, separation from their sports teams, separation from their trusted adults and teachers, separation from normal social interaction. And I thought, we do this on purpose to children. You know, when, when we incarcerate juveniles, we do this on purpose, and yet there was a seeming disconnect to this idea. Suddenly this was a novel concept that children were going to suffer when they were kept apart, right? So, so my hope is in the Q&A we might touch some on those questions of, of isolation versus connection, and I think Norway as one place that demonstrates that we don't need to reevaluate, uh, reinvent the wheel, um, shows what a difference that, that connection can make as opposed to isolation. I hope we'll allow Dr. Weinstock to talk some about her, the measures that she's found in terms of what can help mitigate the suicide risk for people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. So I'm, I'm loath, as you can tell, I'm loath to cede the microphone, but I'm also having participated in the Q&A of the last panel, having witnessed that, I'm really eager to hear some of the questions that arise from the audience. So I am going to yield yield the microphone and invite questions from the audience at this point with those gentle suggestions should the spirit move you. So I'll yield to the floor. Hello, thank you. Um, I had a very painful experience uh, um, eight years ago. My son had a major psychotic breakdown. He almost died. And I was absolutely amazed when he went to an Allen Hospital oversight by lifespan. You're talking about oversight? These people were in most of them the worst crises of their life. He was as vulnerable as a human being can be. Yet the environment he was in was absolutely not for anybody. The very disturbing environment with no real design to make the social environment safe for these people in the most vulnerable time of their life. And afterwards I was talking to the psychiatrist who was a professor at the Brown University Medical School, psychiatrist, and I said, I don't understand if you took a team of people, social workers, doctors, et cetera, come in there and look around, you would clearly see that the, that the environment is absolutely not helpful and actually more traumatizing. So don't you have conversations about how this place is designed? And he said, no, we're guests there. Now, if this is still going on, if lifespan is this bureaucracy that does whatever it does with the evil profit thing there, and there are not conversations with the teaching at, at Brown University and other medical schools, uh, this, I'm sorry, this is madness. So um, I wanted to know about how this kind of experience is connected to people who end up in prison, uh, a, a person in, in deep trouble who gets even, even more traumatized when they go to the emergency room and then what happens from there ending up in prison. Thank you. Dr. Weinstein, can you speak a little bit about I can, that? yes. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about that, and I'm really, you know, sorry to hear about the experience of you and your son and your family. I, you know, one of the things that's, I was, so I work in the field of suicidology. We study suicide risk and prevention. And one of the big topics of conversation that exists within our field is, um, inpatient hospitalization and does inpatient hospitalization work what you know people are suicidal they're placed in the hospital and I have a different perspective too because I work at the intersection of healthcare and the criminal legal system and so you know I was just at a dinner the other night where people were comparing 911 versus 988 and they were saying well 988 is going to um, be a better better avenue for people because they're going to um, be more likely to um, come into contact with people who are trained to manage the crisis versus the police, for example. And, um, and we can keep them out of the hospital because they were talking about inpatient hospitalization as something that we actually don't know if it works or not. There's so little research on the benefits of inpatient hospitalization. So we just don't know. And so the question is really, you know, we're, you know the question is if we call 988, we're gonna keep people out of the hospital. And I'm thinking if we call, you know, I'm thinking a totally other perspective, which is I'm just happy we're not calling 911 because we're keeping people out of jail. 
Um, and to me, I'm like, if only we could get people to the hospital. So it's, it's a really challenging, um, complex set of issues we're dealing with. With that said, what I think what we really need and what we don't have in our society and in, in the United States is crisis service and um, acute crisis stabilization, because that would address both of these issues, right? So rather than having police respond to psychiatric crisis and triaging people to jails, um, or calling 911 or 988 and having people sent to the hospital, if we had a trained group of people who could respond to acute crisis and manage the situation and help triage people to other levels of care, that would be the most ideal, right? Because locking people up in an inpatient unit, again, some people will argue that that's absolutely necessary to keep someone safe, but it's not entirely clear that it's the most therapeutic either, quite frankly, and I'm saying that as a professor of psychiatry. Um, but, but those are the different levels I think we're talking about here, is that we don't have crisis response, and without crisis response, we're balancing jail versus inpatient hospital. And to me, neither of those seem really ideal for people who, who just need acute care and support. Can I add something? So something that, um, that hasn't really been put front and center, but that I wanted to put on the table, and I think it follows up. I, I think it's implicit in much of what we're saying, but I just wanted to say it outright which is that one of the major problems is that society, and in particular these institutions, do not value everyone's pain the same. And so my father is bipolar, and we've had a number of psychiatric crises, and in that case, he lives in a rural area in Vermont, and, and actually a family practitioner came to the house to do exactly what you're describing. Now, what would it have looked like if he were a 17-year-old black young man in my hometown of New Haven, it would not look the same, right? And so this racism and the way that in particular the, the pain and suffering of, of African Americans in this country, I do think undergirds a lot of not just the systemic neglect, but the systemic abuse. Um, and so, for example, just to name another one, so in the prison system, if you, ha there are certain magical diagnoses that will get you medical care or mental health care. And, and we could talk about very much what you're describing hits my heart, I'm so sorry for your son. Um, in prison, if you have those magical diagnoses, you will get mental health care. That mental health care will be really subpar. I am of the opinion that prisons cannot be therapeutic places for the reasons we've discussed. However, if you don't have the right diagnosis, then actually you're, you get taken into the category of just being a bad person. You'll get labeled with, the, with being antisocial, et cetera, and then you're gonna get put in the setting that I kind of illustrated during my talk. So I also just wanna acknowledge that, and, and, and whether or not you're going to be identified as someone who has a, a quote unquote illness or someone who's just a bad person, very much will depend on the color of your skin and how you're perceived. And so at Northern, 80% of the people were black or brown. Um, and that is disproportionate even in a very racist criminal legal system overall. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, um, I'm next, oh, okay, I, I'm curious. Um, the role of uh, gun violence, right? You know, I live in the inner city, and when you get in a street fight, first thing you think about is going for your gun, right? And it can lead to a real serious charge, right? So what does mental uh, kind of illness play? You know, what, what's the logic like with, with all these guns around? Even, even like Columbine, with young people, you know, going to take out all their classmates with a gun, right? This thing of gun violence and mental illness and, you know, being a man, it, it seems kind of strange, but maybe you guys can explain the, this, this gun crisis we have in America and where mental illness is playing a role in, in this. Uh, um, Do we want to take a few questions just before reaching out? Would you like to? Sure. 
Hope suggesting, so I, I would love to respond to that, and Hope suggesting that she's seeing murmurings of a few questions. So perhaps we could have a few questions in order and then um, address them one at a time, but I, I will definitely not lose track of that, so thank you. Um, hi, my name is Ella, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here, and in some of the research I do, a lot of the women I worked with complain about the timeliness and the waiting that they had to do for pertinent care. And I was wondering if you could speak to some of that in your respective realms, and what does it mean to really wait, and how these people are forced to wait for timely healthcare needs, and how that puts them at greater risk for worse health outcomes, but even death. And I would just love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Thank you. Is that for corrections or just in general? Here. So timeliness of care and, and forced to wait. So, for yeah. example, sorry, I don't need a mic, honestly. Um, for some of the people I worked with, like if they were dealing with mental health issues, they would say, "Should I still use it?" Sorry, sorry, I'll still use it. Um, so, like for some of the people I were working with that were dealing with mental health issues, they weren't getting timely medications. That where they were suicidal ideations were getting worse. I had a woman who I worked with that was living with cirrhosis and is not getting her proper medication to keep her ammonia levels down. I have women that were um, considered having a risky pregnancy or a high, excuse me, a high-risk pregnancy for something that's called like an incompetent or lazy cervix and they're not getting their weekly McKenna shot to help can prevent them from going into premature labor. And how sometimes this, the system kind of keeps these people waiting because they're not deemed as important, they're not deemed as worthy of receiving the care that is necessary for them. So I would love to hear about how you kind of see this interacting in some of your respective fields and how you see people not only being forced to wait, but how it's also affecting them in their potential for life outcomes and health outcomes. Okay. Could we hear, hear one more question and then we'll turn it loose to our panelists to respond. Thank you. Uh, diagnosis also in the case of Leonard Peltier and so many others and when I think about doctors um, you know I one of my mentors is Dr. Paul Farmer who was an anthropologist and I got to know Brian Stevenson as well and I think about like again how life is valued behind the wall whose life holds value and you know the fact that death by medical neglect is real and we hear about it constantly. And as a doctor or as, as someone in the healthcare field, I know doctors specifically, you take a Hippocratic oath to first do no harm. How is that applied behind the wall where there seems to be a, a lack of constitutionality when it comes to the human rights of those who are incarcerated? Thank you. Thank you for much more articulating a question that I tried to pose earlier. So I really appreciate that. So, so I, I am going to turn over the timeliness of care and medical neglect questions in just a minute. But I would like to respond just briefly to say that connection between mental illness and guns, I think, is a larger question about connection to mental illness and violence. What we know is that people with mental illness are far more likely to be victims of violence than to commit violence. So as Amanda raises, um, media narratives and how they drive our perceptions. And this is certainly true behind prison walls as well. Um, people with mental illness are, are much more vulnerable to um, being victims of violence when they are incarcerated um, than those who are not. So, so I think, and this is, um, Dr. Weinstock mentioned earlier, you know, when do you start to um, shift from um, advocacy to activism, um, and I think um, many of us in medicine would say that the problem with gun violence as an epidemiological question comes from the presence of guns. <laughs> um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not introduce that entirely new topic at the moment, but just to try to decouple mental illness from violence in a way that I think has been intentionally coupled together by the media. Um, but, but I do think this question of, of timeliness of care, of access to care, and again, of, of labeling, you know, some of the behaviors that we see as a rational response in, in environments like Northern, where people have been um, completely disempowered when all of their ability to um, seek care, give voice to their medical and mental health needs is taken away. Um, it is a normal human response to resort to 
banging your head against the wall, hurting yourself to try to seek medical care. We see this in other environments that are non-carceral environments um, where people are reduced to no way to articulate their needs, and so they're reduced to these ways that then are interpreted as pathological, are interpreted as signs of um, bad behavior, of antisocial or oppositional behavior. So, um, so I would like to say, how, how do those things play into the delay for care, the timeliness of care? How can we provide um, care in this system that um, so often we see people not getting the care that we need? So what are some of the answers there? And this is where I'm happy to turn it over to others of you. Maybe I'll, uh, <clears throat> having provided a lot of care, over the last decades. And I will point out that uh, my Tuesday mornings when I go to the Rhode Island Department of Corrections are often the highlight of my week because it's just wonderful to be able to provide care to people that need it, that want it, that, uh, that may be not getting it, if not uh, for me or someone else going there. Um, so uh, it's, I find it very rewarding, but I want to, you know, say again that I, you know, we don't know the quality of care in this country behind bars because we're not checking it. Nobody's looking at it. Bad things happen, people get sued, and that's, you know, that's like a little window into some of the stuff that's going on, but a lot of it we don't have any idea. Um, I have a, uh, uh, um, uh, person I trained, worked with, he went to medical school and worked with him as training and then he worked at the Department of Corrections for the last several years. Um, and I got to watch him work and he had some friction there because he would sit down with the patients, he would talk to them, he would treat them as he would any other patient and he would explain to them what's going on and he would come up with a plan. And often there would be a correctional officer nearby who was unhappy with what he was doing. Because the correctional officer realized this patient is getting better care than the officer himself was getting with his own doctor on the outside. And really, that created some friction uh, uh, because of that. That didn't change his behavior. Now, he recently moved down to Florida and got hired to work in a correctional facility there. He's been there three weeks. And I just talked to him the night before last and said, well, you know, how was, how was it going? He said, well, the electronic medical record is the same. The patients seem the same. They have a lot of the similar issues as the patients here. The officers seem to have a lot of the same attitudes. The whole system is kind of crazy in some ways. Um, but, but the patients don't understand. Like, you know, they're just confused that he's actually treating them like they need to be treated, like, they, like anybody should be treated. Um, and I, I, so I... You know, you just have these little glimmers into what's happened, but I, I think there's there's no question that there is death by medical neglect. It happens all the time, and you know, I've strived to do the best I can to help the Rhode Island system improve, and I think we've made a lot of headway there. Um, but there's there's room to improve, and you know, there's room to improve in the healthcare on the outside as well. Uh, it's not like we have perfect healthcare everywhere, but uh, I think we really need oversight. Um, and we need to know how much we're spending and what we're getting for it. Thanks. Yeah. I think that, I mean, if part of the, if like the question behind the questions in a way is what should be done, because clearly, I think you asked for our position on net medical neglect. I don't think any of us would disagree with the premise of the question, which is that it occurs and it's absolutely unacceptable. And then the question is, okay, so what, right? And so you're hearing, I think, a lot of internal conflicts among all three of us who are charged with, um, we're, we're going in and out of the system because we have these semi-official roles that gives us um, privileged access in a way, right? And so how do you be both in and out of a system um, that is so damnably corrupt and actively perpetrates harm. That is a, that's like a soul question that you know, maybe some of you could give me some therapy for. I don't know. Here's what I do know. I think what we need is people within the system who have power and leadership to tell the truth, which is oversight, and two, to take some leadership. And if you are telling me that, that so for example, um, Connecticut will say, well, we're doing our best, but we have so many open jobs 
and we can't get doctors or mental health workers into the system. That is actually a true fact. So why are there delays? One, because there's not enough funding. Two, though, because nobody wants these jobs. They are really tough jobs. But then we have to ask, why are they such tough jobs? Because those professionals cannot, in good conscience, especially, I think, in mental health, but, but I think to, in medical health to some degree as well, cannot, in good conscience, go to their jobs. Because the system is set up to put them in that double bind. How, as a mental health care worker, can you provide therapy if there is a correction officer who is sitting literally outside the door? How can you perform your job if someone is chained to the floor? You cannot. And so until we have some leadership from the inside who will tell the truth and then say, we cannot do the function that you are demanding of a society, so actually we are not gonna keep taking people. We're closed, we are closed for business. You're gonna have to figure out how to deal with it because actually we're closed. And of course, that's not gonna happen, except, I don't know, maybe in some ways it will. And I'll just leave with saying that the COVID crisis gave us a test point. And I, and I wrote an article about this that probably three people read. But, but that, that basically said, okay, cause I was so, I am such an optimist, you all. And so I thought, oh gee, you know, maybe COVID will be a moment when our society says, oh, the health of the people on the inside is directly connected with the health of the people on the outside. And what I want for my child is what I should want for every human being, right? Did that happen? No. How much, and actually we did a study and, and lawyers all over the country, all over the world were saying, actually, corrections leaders, this is a public health emergency. This is a crisis. You do have the power to take what, it, what you need to do. And we figured out in Connecticut, all it would have take to, to taken to decrease our population by 50% so that we could get some semblance of social distancing was to let people out who were within 90 days of their sentence, all right? Did that happen? No. Why? Because they were scared. They were scared, and who were they scared of? The politicians. So that, so you know, it's a whole big circle. <laughs> but I just want to say I think that there are solutions, and I think that it does take moral leadership. I see someone with her hand way, way up in the air, and I, but I don't have the power to call. Her. I, I have the mic. Okay. Um, but okay. May I speak? Uh, are you finished? I, I'm finished. Thank you. Um, my concern, I'm with the Mumia Health Committee, and I, what I'm trying to say is that um, all, all of what you're saying is invoking a lot of personal feelings because I have a close loved one who was shot by the police and nearly killed, um, and I got pretty involved with it. Uh, I think everybody should have that experience, uh, or maybe they shouldn't. but. Excuse me. Um, I, I'd like to, you know, you didn't make a distinction between forensic hospitals and non-forensic hospitals. I think you, sh you know, in the conversation, that didn't come up. My cousin was sent to a forensic hospital, for which I was grateful in a way. I was more grateful when she escaped, basically, uh, through going through a certain process she did. Uh, and which, in a way, I became a, sort of a victim through uh, the police who followed up on it. Never mind. Um, but at the time, I got involved with NAMI. And lately, it's been think I've been thinking about trying to help Mumia, of course. And NAMI is a rather large organization, the National Association for the Mentally Ill, which I got the Irish Award for, God forbid. I hid the trophy I got so my, fr my cousin wouldn't see it, um, you know, for my work with NAMI, uh, because they never really condemned the fact that the police nearly killed her, that the fact that we couldn't visit her, this was in Florida, in the hospital, she was shackled, and she was shackled to and from the forensic hospital in Tallahassee she wind up, wound up with, so, I mean, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I think it, it, and, and, is, and, the, is the question large? The question is, what about NAMI? Is this a resource that we could maybe reach out to yeah. to help? I think that's get, a great idea. Because uh -huh. a huge 
a huge portion of the people in prison are mentally ill. And a lot of people see that as well. Isolation is great. This is something that came out in a workshop I went to at Temple University uh, having to do with inside out. But anyhow, mm -hmm. that one of the people at, the, uh, at that conference said, well, it's what they should be doing. They should be repenting for their sins. I mean, there, there's all kinds of people that are seemingly Thank Thank you. I, I may, so I may just. What I'm asking is, uh, what about NAMI, for one thing? Great. And how much do you know about them? And sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to just very politely and gently um, stop you there because I think that we understand the question, and I do see that there's someone who. I, I'm worried yeah. about that arm. It's going to yeah. fall off. It's been up there so long. So, so, so to answer your question, yes, NAMI has been. I think um, it depends on the chapter, um, and I think that. Uh, whether or not folks um, at NAMI are willing to kind of put their necks out for folks who are incarcerated. I think it depends on the chapter in Connecticut. Um, they were very supportive of the work that we were doing to end solitary. And, um, and I would just say there's also other groups that, and it's a membership group, so there's a lot of potential. So, they, yeah, I know we have a question waiting. Go right ahead, Okay. Um, uh, this is in no disrespect to anyone on the panel, but I'm seeing right now is a panel of white body people. And I'm wondering why is there no one, or maybe a BIPOC person up there. But how does this, if this is what I, is represented here, what is represented who goes into the prison if the majority of people are brown and black people, mm -hmm. okay? So, mm -hmm. You know, as Franz Fanon, <laughs> <laughs> would say this is a statement within itself right here. So can we talk on this? I need to see a brown or black body up there. Yeah, sure. So you, I don't think you'll see a black or brown body up here today, but I think your point's very well taken. And I think that what I was trying to, to illustrate is that I think change cannot come from a panel like this, period, full stop. And I think that uh, none of us would purport to have any or most of the answers. Um, the work that, that we're trying to do is to support people who are coming, most of whom are black and brown led, so Stop Solitary is um, an organization by and for people with direct experience. They are BIPOC folks. And so I think your point is entirely spot on. And so, for example, with this idea of oversight, it can't be oversight as usual. It needs to be oversight that is representative of the people whose lives are at stake. So I wholeheartedly agree with you, um, and thank you. Thank you, I appreciate y'all. My name is Vanessa. Um, I've actually been volunteering at, um, oh, this is like, this is gonna be hard, at MCI Norfolk since December 2017. So, you know, like, just thank you for everyone that's doing your work going in. Um, know that we're, we're all very much appreciated in that space. Um, my question is um, really for Hope. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, you were talking about the oversight um, that was approved, I guess, in Connecticut. And if you can speak more about how that happened, how that was initiated, um, how we could get something like that going. Um, we've been experiencing, I think because the group that I work with is so effective, a lot of kind of retaliation and backlash. Right now, we're actually kind of in a receivership um, and not even are able to work um, with youth on the outside, which we were originally. And I think that is a direct, um, kind of backlash on folks speaking up on, on mass incarceration and systemic oppression of um, kind of rallying support in the yard and beyond the wall. And so if you could just speak a little more about this work in Connecticut um, and what we can do to, to see more of this oversight that is representative of folks um, that have experienced incarceration and also um, folks that are impacted in community. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for your work. Um, so let's just be sure to connect before I I leave and um, so uh, there, there, 
Yeah, so, so the idea came, as I mentioned, from, from um, incarcerated people and people who had directly seen how the system shapes and shifts and morphs um, to preserve its own power. Um, and the way that it looks, it's not perfect, but it's a committee of nine people, um, two of whom um, are coming from advocacy groups on behalf, who for the welfare of people who um, are incarcerated, and then two of whom have lived experience, so four of the nine. And then the remaining five are quote unquote experts um, with, from medical, mental health, um, and then there's one person with corrections experience. Um, the <laughs> Democratic leadership then did a kind of dirty trick and actually added two more <laughs> people through a, an unrelated bill that we only found out about six months later where they added um, two people um, who ended up being the vice president of the corrections union and a current staff member. So that's the fight that we're fighting right now. Um, so it's not easy. We're just getting off the ground. I can connect you up also with folks in um, Massachusetts. Um, I have a former student who's trying to build something very similar, but I'm sure it will be better because <laughs> um, uh, I think it will be even more community-based uh, up there. And I think um, I'm sure there are other models. So happy to connect with you and to talk more. I'll just say that the retaliation thing is no joke. Like it is really real um, and also happy to talk with you about that too. Yeah. I just want to say, I've been sitting here for a while, watching this mic go all over the place, raising my hand, and I don't know why there's nobody on these panels from yesterday and today that's been formerly incarcerated that they can also speak on their experience. Like my, I was in solitary confinement for six months got out, released from solitary confinement into the streets with no mechanism of where the hell I'm going. And, no, and y'all sitting here, these PhDs and PFS talking about this and that, but I don't hear the, the, the compassion for these prisoners and these, and these prisoners around the country. Now, now we just did, we just made seven coffins. Seven coffins last, what, this, this month, right? Went to the PDB, PDD fest and crashed the party with these seven deaths that happened in the prison this month, September 8th. And nobody, nobody saying anything about that. And I'm kind of frustrated because I hear, I like, is your name Laura, young lady? Lauren. Lauren, I like um, what you said that you need to probably do some activism work and, and well, you need to join my club. I, I would love to join your club and I will find you when the panel ends today. Okay, okay. so I guess my final question is, how can the health and the well-being of these prisoners inside get the adequate care that they need without them killing themselves while they're in solitary confinement. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think I really appreciate you standing up and giving voice to that. I think that is a question that, that we share with you. So I, I appreciate you giving voice to that. And I think that compassion is at the heart of this work. And I appreciate you naming that for us. I see Amanda over my shoulder. Uh, oh, yeah, we, got so, a, we got a burning question oh, oh, over okay, here. OK, thank you. Okay, I'm, I, I do mind, I do mind. Yeah, we're going to have to pause. So um, this is, you know, the, po the point is to start a conversation here and to start asking the really hard questions. And I appreciate that from the audience. I appreciate that from the panelists. Um, and we will um, continue this over lunch. And this is the first gathering of what will be many. This is meant to be a jumping off point and not a be all and end all. I do want to give um, plenty of time because we have a really important panel this afternoon that will speak to women and gender, which will close the symposium much in the way that it was opened. We also have an important recording to listen to this afternoon from a currently incarcerated poet who went through 
a great deal um, to record some poetry for us and has been sending his poetry out of prison on lined pieces of paper to be published. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for their engagement. I wanna thank this panel. And I also wanna say that uh, we need to think a lot about the stigma of mental health care in the US that um, perpetuates these systems. So thank you, panel. We will return at 2.15 promptly to finalize our afternoon. Thank you.